So we want to shift gears now within the capital stack and transition from a discussion of equity over to debt. And in particular, why would we use debt? Well, usually the reason that it's used is because it allows us to increase the equity returns. So let's now bring in a capital stack on the one side here, and then imagine at some point in the future that that company has grown to be larger here on the right-hand side. Well, you can see the difference in the height of the capital stack or the size of the enterprise is actually not that much larger on the right-hand side in that future state. But now if we focus our attention to the equity in navy blue, we can see that there's been substantial growth in the equity over that three to five year period. In fact, we're showing here an internal rate of return or an IRR over that period of 28%. So this is actually showing us the type of time frame of three to five years and the type of return of 28% that a private equity fund may be interested in achieving. And the reason it achieved this high rate of return was because it used debt in the capital structure to leverage the investment. Now, as we discussed earlier, as companies become more mature, they have more access to debt capital. But if we want to assess the debt capacity of a company, we can look at three categories of measures, general measures, balance sheet measures, and cash flow measures. So first of all, some general measures to assess debt capacity could be the level of EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. You can also look at the volatility and the stability of the EBITDA, the capital expenditure, and also the cyclicality, risk, or the other competitors operating in the same industry. If we shift our focus to look at the balance sheet, there we can measure debt to equity, debt to capital, and debt to assets. And finally, cash flow measures are also used. And often we can use metrics like total debt to EBITDA, senior debt to EBITDA, or net debt to EBITDA. They can also look at EBITDA minus CapEx to interest ratios. Now, if we bring a capital stack into the left-hand side, what we want to do here is focus our attention to the top of the stack, to the senior debt. Senior debt will often involve a revolver or a revolving line of credit, which is typically coming from a bank. While the revolver is a short-term piece of debt, that lender would also be supplying longer-term pieces of debt in the form of term loans. These would have a fixed schedule where they would be repaying or they'd be amortized and have a final principal repayment. And they can be stacked. You could have a term loan A and a term loan B, etc. Now, in order to assess the capacity for senior debt, the lender would often be looking to provide two to three times the EBITDA that the company generates. It also may require at least two times interest coverage. Now, typically, these senior debt loans would be provided by commercial banks, credit companies, and insurance companies. Now, if we again bring in a capital stack, let's now focus our attention on subordinated debt. Subordinated debt often is used to fill a funding gap, meaning the company has maxed out the amount of senior debt that's available, so then it goes to subordinated debt for additional capital. Now, there can be lots of different types of subordinated debt, like high-yield bonds, mezzanine debt, which is warrantless or warranted, PIC notes, which stand for payment in kind notes, or vendor notes. So now we've stacked the subordinated debt in order so that there is more subordination towards the bottom with the vendor notes. And these more subordinated investors would obviously demand a higher rate of return. And we could also put a line through these various pieces of subordinated debt to show the ones that could result in dilution, showing that there could be increased dilution as we tend down towards the vendor notes.
Now, credit ratings are done by a number of different credit rating agencies, which you may have heard of, like Moody's, S&P, Fitch, or DBRS. Each of these rating agencies rates different types of corporate debt, and they each have their own system in order to rate the debt. Now, we could simplify these ratings by putting a line right down the middle of the ratings and divide it into investment grade debt on the top, which would be low risk, low return, and also low fees. Now, on the bottom, we would have non investment grade debt or high yield debt, as it's often called, higher risk, higher return, and higher fees. Now let's visualize and understand some different debt repayment profiles. So what we're looking at here is the amount of debt in the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. So a company may have a senior debt tranche A with equal amortization, paying back gradually over time all the way down to a balance of zero. It may also have a tranche B of senior debt as well that would also be amortizing over time, but at maturity, there would be a balloon repayment to pay it all the way down to a balance of zero. So as we work down the capital stack, we may also have a piece of mezzanine debt. There would be no principal repayment at all until maturity, at which case it is all paid at once in a bullet repayment. And even more subordinated, you may have a piece of pick debt or payment in kind debt, where the amount of debt is actually increasing over time up until the point of maturity, at which case it's all paid back in one go with a bullet repayment. So what you'll notice with this diagram is that the more senior lenders are getting paid back their principal much sooner than the subordinated lenders. And in the extreme example of the PIC debt, the amount of principal is actually increasing over time, and it's not paid back at all until final maturity. So let's have a discussion here about the trade-offs between debt and equity. And we really want to talk about the pros and cons. So on the equity side, while there's no maturity date and no capital repayment that's required, the lender has total ownership and a degree of control over the business. Equity typically has voting rights, and it doesn't involve any interest payments or mandatory fixed repayments. It provides overall the maximum operational flexibility for the corporation. But what we can also say about equity is that, that it has a high implied cost of capital, expects a high rate of return, both through dividends and capital appreciation, and it has last claim on the firm's assets in the event of a liquidation. So what can we say about debt? Well, it has interest payments and often has a fixed repayment schedule. It prevents dilution of equity and has a lower cost than equity, which is usually the reason that corporations prefer to use debt. It also has first claim on the firm's assets in the event of a liquidation. But what we can also say about debt, it requires covenants and financial performance metrics that must be met by the organization, it contains restrictions on operational flexibility, and sometimes can even push a company into default or bankruptcy. So here we want to discuss capital structure, which refers to the amount of debt and or equity that a firm uses in order to fund its operations and finance its assets. And then in order to optimize the capital structure, the firm would then decide if it needs to issue more debt or more equity. We can also talk about the idea of leverage. And here's an example with low leverage, which refers to the amount of debt which has been used in the capital structure, which is only about 20%. An example on the right-hand side would be high leverage. In this case, we're using 80% debt in the capital structure. So leverage really refers to the amount of debt used in the capital structure.
So let's now continue this discussion of the optimal capital structure. It's essentially a discussion about the amount of equity versus the amount of debt. And it relies on a large number of factors. The current economic climate, it could be the business's existing capital structure or the life cycle stage that the business is at. Now, earlier, we discussed some pros and cons of using debt and equity in the capital structure. For instance, having too much debt can obviously increase the risk of a default in one of the repayments. On the other hand, depending too heavily on equity may dilute earnings and value for the original shareholders. Now, let's dig a little bit deeper into the optimal capital structure. And effectively, companies are looking for the optimal combination of debt and equity in order to minimize the cost of capital. If we're being more specific, the optimal capital structure actually occurs at the minimum of what we call the weighted average cost of capital, or the WAC. So let's now bring in a chart to really illustrate this point. On the vertical axis, we have the weighted average cost of capital, or the WAC. And at the bottom, we have the debt to total capital, or the leverage. If we bring in this curve, we can see that a company, if the company used too little debt, then it would have a relatively high WAC because it's using too much equity. On the other end of the spectrum, if the company was using an excessive amount of debt, then the interest cost would likely be high, and it would also have a high weighted average cost of capital. So right in the middle at point B, we have a sweet spot where the company has optimized the capital structure, i.e. it has flexed the amount of debt and equity to the point where it's reached the minimum weighted average cost of capital, or WAC. So let's discuss conceptually the weighted average cost of capital, or the WAC. It's essentially the proportion of debt and equity a firm has multiplied through by their respective costs. So let's bring in a diagram with the cost of equity and the cost of debt. We can think about the cost of equity as the rate of return a shareholder would require in order to invest equity into a business. And similarly, the cost of debt would be the rate of return that a lender would require given the risk of the business. So one thing that we've started to discuss is that the optimal capital structure of a firm is defined as the proportion of debt and equity that results in the lowest weighted average cost of capital or WAC for the firm. So now let's get into a little bit more detail with a WAC formula. We have a diagram here in a mix of debt and equity. We could calculate the percentage of net debt and the percentage of equity. In order to get the WAC, we would then multiply those percentages through by the cost of debt and the cost of equity. What this would give us is the relative contribution from each of these sources of capital. If we then add those sources of contribution, we get the overall cost of capital or the WAC. So let's go deeper to look at an example with numbers applied now. We have 14% debt and 86% equity. If we bring in the cost of debt at 3.5% and the cost of equity at 9%, we can multiply these through to get 0.5% and 7.7% respectively. Once we add those two figures together, we get the weighted average cost of capital for the firm at 8.2%. Now that we've gone through a calculation, let's hop into Excel and look at a real example and see how this weighted average cost of capital gets applied into decision making. 